Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, I should uh, give out a secret to you. Uh, to me, it has always been a measure of uh, dedicated friendship when someone can pronounce my name just like that. <laughs> And this is what Mark has been doing uh, for some time now. Um, and uh, really, this uh, is probably the most visible, the most obvious sign of a great partnership, great relationship that we've had, uh, of course, on the personal level. But uh, it all started by a common um, appreciation of the importance of uh, uh, the uh, core mission of this institute, the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy. Uh, while Mark was uh, kindly uh, reading out uh, what I've been trying to do over quite a few years already, um, I was thinking um, the, the, how the, the appreciation of cultural diplomacy uh, has been changing uh, over the years. Of course, the first thing was to find the good definition for what it's all about, what cultural diplomacy is all about. But then um, I was watching him, listening to him, and I was saying, we have arrived at a point when I believe we all appreciate that we need it. Uh, since he made this very kind reference to my country, Bulgaria, which uh, maybe is even not very well known to some of you, uh, I'm not going into geography or history, I promise. If you want me to, I can do that on a separate note. But uh, I know how important it is for my country. Because I know that, let's say in America, the superpower of the world, there is no excessive knowledge about Bulgaria. And this is the cultural uh, uh, knowledge or, or, or information or diplomacy. So a big part of our work here at this embassy is to make the country, the nation, better known. Yes, we do need cultural diplomacy. Having said this, uh, even countries, big countries, and of course immediately Russia, China, the US, which I mentioned already, come to mind. It may be believed that being as big as, and as powerful as the US, for example, you may not need such kind of uh, soft things, details, uh, um, less, less um, impressive maybe uh, um, actions, uh, uh, which cultural diplomacy may be all about at times. Um, and I think that up to a certain point, uh, this was the general belief. Uh, a big power, a superpower, a military power shouldn't waste time on, on, on such details, on such minor things as culture and uh, better understanding and knowing more about the others and the others knowing more about you. Uh, but times have changed. So um, I would like to, in a more orderly way, go through what my reflections are, but not just mine, a general appreciation is of um, the role of cult cultural diplomacy these days. Um, if asked what the greatest challenges the world faces today are, people may be inclined to refer to globalization, the economic crisis, um, the rapid pace of change, which may be setting back a number of countries um, and societies, the rising level of the oceans. We were just discussing climate change, which, yes, indeed, it is a big challenge and uh, a risk uh, humanity needs to take care of. It is uh, unsustainable development, it is poverty, it is the widening uh, inequalities, the lack of future perspectives for entire social groups, the youth in particular. However, at the heart of these challenges lies the uh, aspiration for peace, which implies the necessity of finding a way of living together better in this world, of growing appreciation of the uncertainty we all live in. Because it is all too often now that we are witnessing the outbreak of uh, new forms of violence. The most important challenge is thus um, how best to approach this uh, unity in diversity uh, challenge by fully taking into consideration the infinite wealth of the cultures of the world and by averting the fear reflex when confronted with the with the otherness, with the aliens, with the difference of what we have known all our lives. Peace has been and remains a permanent ideal and aspiration, as well as a right and a duty to all of us. However, in a fast-paced, interconnected world, 
peace is at risk. While world wars are becoming a thing of the past, violence, civil strife, and conflict continue to define the lives of millions, and internal conflicts and terrorist attacks demonstrate that the presence of peace can never be taken for granted. As an ongoing process of political, economic, and cultural negotiation, peace requires consistent engineering, vigilance, and active participation. It implies commitment and a long-term vision, and thus entails a blend of traditional and contemporary ways of understanding the roots of conflicts, the ways of mitigating violence, and paths towards reconciliation and healing. In our globalized world, a conflict, a conflict anywhere can generate conflict everywhere. In times of unprecedented communication, opportunities, interconnectedness, and migration, the risks to peace also lie in the inequalities, fanaticism, and marginalization of vulnerable groups, as well as the rejection and ignorance of other cultures, together with their traditions, beliefs, and history. In this context, culture emerges as an essential factor for lasting peace. In fact, neither equitable progress nor social cohesion are truly possible if culture is left to one side, if it is totally ignored. On the contrary, the road to inclusive social and economic development, environmental sustainability, peace and security is firmly grounded in culture, understood in its spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional dimensions, and encompassing diverse value systems, traditions, and beliefs. Culture informs and influences people's relations to sustainable development, conflicts, and reconciliation in a distinct but direct manner. It determines and creates paths for lasting conflict resolution and healing. Yet recent research has convincingly pinpointed the fact that the cultural dimension is often at the heart of peace building processes by being at once part of the problem and part of the solution simultaneously. As a source of identity, meaning, and belonging, culture can both facilitate social cohesion and justify social exclusion and xenophobia at the same time. A new type of conflict has emerged, identity-based, ethnopolitical conflict, which has escaped the traditional resource and interest-based resolution methods. Consequently, the changing nature of present-day conflicts, which occur less between states and more often within them, and which are led not by organized armies, but by paramilitary groups and uh, with civilians increasingly in the crossfire, call for new consideration about conflict resolution and methods of reconciliation and resolving them. In these new wars, culture stands to the forefront as a, really a main tool in looking for these solutions. While culture can be found at the heart of many of today's conflicts, it is through cultural diplomacy that the root causes of violence, the prevention of crisis, and the exploration of conflict resolution and reconciliation strategies must be explored. It can be used as a method of reframing the terms of the conflict and transforming exclusive and adversarial positions into opportunities for articulation and reinvention. In order for cultural diplomacy to succeed in practical terms, it needs to include First and foremost, an acknowledgement by political and religious leaders that peace, justice, and mutual respect are basic. And they are considered as uh, such values in all religions, as well as central assumptions in international law and diplomacy. I think that one of the big changes that happened over the past years was this transition from classical conflict and classical war to those regional strifes, regional wars, and regional conflict. 
um, the nuclearization, I would say, of the warring factions has further aggravated and complicated the attempts of the international community to resolve ongoing conflicts. I would now like to very briefly mention some of the most um, uh, critical ones that are, I would call them, ongoing conflicts at this very point in time. Also because my country happens to have become a front frontline state in one of them. And I'm now referring to the situation um, with the Russian-Ukraine conflict, the accession of the Crimea, and the consequences that resulted um, as a result of it after that. Uh, but I'm talking to my counterparts here in, um, in, in, in Washington and the US in general. I'm often being asked the question, uh, what's the situation with Bulgaria? Um, are you practically threatened, uh, militarily threatened, because some countries are. It's not, it's Crimea, of course, that uh, was um, practically annexed, um, not without a threat of force, not use, but very visible, very, very imposing presence of military troops there. There is Moldova. There are other areas, uh, or rather parts in that bigger area, that may feel militarily threatened. In the case of Bulgaria, I always answer, and that just struck me in one of these conversations that I was having in the State Department. In a very weird, in a paradoxical way, I wish we were facing a direct military threat. Because then you know exactly who is on the other side. And I think that's true for practically all conventional conflicts of the past. And then you can organize yourself, but for better or worse, uh, but it's a clearer, a clearer perspective, a clearer path. The danger about the, these invisible threats, which may mean excessive influence, excessive impact on a country, or it may mean influencing certain groups in the country, and that particularly goes for religion. These are conflicts and threats and risks of an entirely different nature, and I'm not sure that we have wisened up enough to know the good answers. And this is why, again, I would say uh, the, 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 the worth of this institute of cultural diplomacy has risen tremendously um, over the past uh, uh, years. Ukraine, Rus Russia slash Ukraine. Uh, I don't know how many of you would remember the Cold War. I can see if very, small number of us who do remember it and have even lived it. Uh, in those years, which now seem to be a distant past, but were only our life until 25 years ago, um, the Cold War uh, was actually provoked by a rivalry between the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc. And we thought this rivalry to have ended 25 years ago. And imagine this year we were marking 25 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and we are still doing this, this is still happening. 10 years of my country's accession to NATO, 10 years of signing our accession agreement into the European Union. Everything looked bright and, and, and hopeful, and we thought the Cold War and that kind of contradictions that were uh, well behind us. However, um, the Russian Ukrainian conflict happened, and uh, the Cold War is being brought back as, as a past experience. And now the big question is, are we again facing a new Cold War? The one that we've already experienced was defined by ideological competition. A communist system versus a capitalist system. An autocratic system versus a democratic system. And by traditional geopolitical rivalry. Um, it was also a rivalry for dominance uh, over nations, uh, areas, but also over military industrial complexes, um, as well as over proxies in the developing world. We should also be able to state this honestly. The, these rivalries were all transported into the developing world. And some of the consequences we are still living with um, uh, even today. Since the demise of the Soviet Union, um, memories of the Cold War have faded. And I'm saying this as a, as a 
person who had lived both before 89 and after. But there is talk now of a new Cold War following Russian President Vladimir Putin's annexation of the Ukrainian peninsula, the Crimea. It began when the Ukrainian government decided not to sign the agreement with the European Union, and that was back in the fall of 2013. Uh, on the surface of it, you may think that this was a trade agreement, which it, it was, but it was much more than that and far beyond that. It was also a political agreement for a permanent association of, uh, of Ukraine with the European Union, which is also kind of a West or part of the West, which again takes us back to the old rivalries, which means that Ukraine would have followed and uh, adhered to European values and principles. From there, the crisis moved very, very quickly to um, regime change and to the whole emergency situation we are faced with uh, uh, in the Ukraine today. Even today, as we speak, the armistice, which was supposed to have been signed, uh, has been violated a number of times. But we, if we put aside political issues and see how culture has been involved in the Ukrainian crisis, we will find that there are a variety of proofs that cultural diplomacy has been taking place there. Because the events we, should be analyzed in, in their broad nature. There was, of course, the, 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 the hot conflict, the, 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 the warring part of it. But at the same time, 40, 40 film directors have united to create a joint project, Babylon 2013, Cinema of a Civil Protest. Their video project was intended to raise awareness about the situation in Ukraine. Art projects have additionally been developing in other different forms. Furthermore, there was an open-air university, as well as a library, which has proven that Maidan, the famous square in Kiev, is not an island in a sea of battles. The places have turned into grounds for sharing, discussing, and creating. It's worth mentioning here the role of propaganda and ideology as a means of encouraging clashes in southern and eastern Ukraine. And you would have noticed that lately a lot has been written about the information war, the propaganda war, which obviously uh, Russia and Mr. Putin have won. Needless to say, uh, this information war has done much more to escalate the conflict than the presence of the physical presence of Russian troops on um, Ukrainian soil. When the conflict was in full swing, it was challenging to find culturally diplomatic ways to assist in the situation. However, we can point out here that something else was happening at the same time on an, another island, and that was uh, the United Kingdom, where the Russian-British bilateral year of culture was held. It was started against the background of a worsening uh, of the Ukraine crisis in February. And when relations with the European Union, Russia, European Union, were frozen down to zero, even below. And this particular event is perceived as a platform for communication between the two nations, even when crisis was and is still at its highest. So this is just an example of what one can do at a time of uh, really uh, acute and, and, and I would even call it hot crisis between two countries, between two nations. Another process was going on before uh, uh, these events of this year, the Arab Spring. You remember how much we were excited by it, how much was written about it today? You tell me, we seem to have forgotten uh, the, the Arab Spring, although we are still dealing with the individual countries. We would like to see what started as Arab Spring continue on a country-by-country -country basis. So any of the hoped-for new developments in the Arab world that could have benefited from cultural diplomacy have regrettably given way to an increased lack of stability across the region as well as in the individual countries. The Arab Spring impacted the region deeply. The transformation it brought about affected the region's domestic policies, as well as the outside world perception of it, of the region and of the countries. Governments around the world are increasingly making use now of soft power tactics to promote their foreign policies, 
and also domestic policies, especially in regions where other forms of diplomacy have failed to, to succeed. In this sense, cultural diplomacy as well as public diplomacy are the effective way to go forward to achieve a country's interest. The governments overthrown during the Arab Spring used these soft power tools for two main reasons. First, they intended to persuade their own people to find other means to resolve existing conflicts. They sought to reach a mutual understanding between their people by suggesting changes on the law and regulations and holding democratic elections. Secondly, the governments believed that those suggestions would alleviate the international pressure and raise their profile by the international community. Therefore, counterbalancing the pressure they were facing internally and the impact that it could cause on their position as governments, on their uh, own uh, political uh, longevity. Cultural and public diplomacy are very effective tools to use in order to pursue a country's interest abroad and internally. However, the efforts of the Arab Spring um, countries' governments to rebrand their states and achieve their objectives to remain in power failed to work. And it did so, it happened so, because the government efforts were demonstrated and were kind of applied too late and also because the people's commitment to transformation was stronger. And they were determined to have a regime change. So yesterday we touched upon something which is extremely interesting to me, and I would appreciate if we discuss it with your participation. What should the interaction between governments and civil society be? Are they partnering in cultural diplomacy? Uh, who and, and should uh, either of the two components, uh, the two actors on the stage of cultural diplomacy overwhelm the other? Uh, how should that partnership occur? Because obviously in the case of Arab Spring, it didn't happen. So that's a big question for me uh, that deserves analyzing. The, the shared and well-divided role, good division of labor between official power, official institutions, government, and the usually, habitually suspicious non-governmental world, civic organizations, which are so powerful exactly in promoting the, the, the benefits of cultural diplomacy at the grassroots level. More dramatic cases to follow, Syria and Iraq. The Obama administration began to consider the conflicts in Syria and Iraq as a single challenge, with the Al-Qaeda-inspired insurgency threatening both countries' governments and the region's broader stability. We remember how the conflict started, very different. Syria's situation is completely different from the Iraq situation. And yet, at the end of the day today, as we speak, there is a blend. So what happened? Uh, was something underestimated or wrongly assessed years ago? And again, these are more questions uh, which we need to answer. So today, what the answer, or not the answer, but the conclusion is, the appreciation, the assessment is that uh, there is a lot in common, there is a common root in the tragic developments in Syria and in Iraq that leads to Al-Qaeda. At the news conference on Thursday, President Obama said that the key to both Syria and Iraq is going to be a combination of what happens inside the country, working with moderate Syrian opposition, working with an Iraqi government that is inclusive, and US laying down a more effective counterterrorism platform that gets all the countries in the region pulling in the same direction. But if we have to achieve this cohesion of countries, it means that the grassroots levels, the popular opinion, the popular forces need to be on board. In these conflicts, it is essential to understand the historical, cultural, religious, and sectorial specifics. In our age of globalization, the dissemination of information via media, mass communication, and social networks is more important than ever before. And in the Middle East, deep distrust for media and traditional uh, monologic communication is rooted in histories of colonization and corruption. So the, this distrust 
it has not come on barren soil. It, it, it also has its roots. Effective public and cultural diplomacy should take into account such cultural and societal factors in a nuanced approach that varies from country to country. Dialogue instead of one-sided communication is key to building a foundation for permanent relationships. Opportunities for discussion where individuals' thoughts and opinions are recognized can have a powerful effect on people's overall openness and receptiveness. In the modern international system, public and cultural diplomacy is the multidisciplinary practice of explaining foreign policy decisions, institutions, and cultural no norms and values to, to the Arab public, not through their governments all the time and necessarily, but instead through direct contact. In essence, their mission is to understand, engage, inform, and influence foreign publics and elites in support of uh, policy objectives. Actually, US brokered peace talks between Israel and Palestinians, if we are to move forward in the Middle East, fell short in April 2014. Tensions between the two communities keep rising when no agreement has been possible in the last months on burning issues such as the Palestinian refugees, the Israeli settlements, or the future of divided Jerusalem. According to Ambassador Baker, the potential for a peaceful diplomatic and cultural solution between Israel and the Palestinians already exists in the various agreements already reached between the two sides that are still valid and can serve as an example to others. However, there is no practical enforcement. It is important to define the relevance of cultural diplomacy to the Middle East peace process and its importance as a model for conflicts around the globe and the search for common values and principles in the arenas of religion, law, and education among the conflicting parties to the dispute. In order for it to succeed practically, it needs to include several steps. First and, pro and foremost, as an appropriate sign to the general public, an acknowledgment, as I mentioned already, by political and religious leaders that peace, justice, and mutual respect are basic values in all religions. Again, yesterday we touched upon that. As well as central assumptions in international law and diplomacy. Secondly, mutual reciprocal acceptance and respect by each religion of the others, whether cross Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Baha'i, or any other. Three, ongoing spiritual and practical dialogue among religious leaders, clergy, and lay leaders to establish common principles and interests, the famous interfaith dialogue. Number four, ending religious incitement and hatred through appropriate guidelines for religious leaders, clergy, and other religious staff, also for civic leaders and government entities, government institutions. Number five, educational programs geared to home, kindergarten, school and college, towards mutual respect and acceptance. Six, ending negative public propaganda, the language of hatred, the use of media, social media and social networks to advocate respect rather than the opposite. Seven, acknowledgement of the rights of all indigenous peoples to their indigenous lands, resources, and properties. A very, very hard one to, 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 to achieve. Eight, enabling unfettered religious and cultural tourism and, visit, and visits of holy sites. And there are many more. The list can go much longer. But these seem to be the most conflictual, the most uh, dissenting um, elements uh, of how a a, an understanding, uh, an agreement can be reached. Just to, 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 to wind up, um, uh, culture and religion matter a great deal in the formation of conflict, and therefore they should play critical and creative role in conflict prevention, resolution, and reconciliation, as well as in social and economic reconstruction. Once millions of people are motivated to resist rational compromises in the name of religion, to fight and kill in the name of their culture, there is simply no way for them to be brought into peace processes without engaging those myths and values that matter to them most. New methods of diplomacy must focus on the way in which leaders at the highest levels and the political leaderships of every civilization involved 
including the political leaderships of religious and cultural entities, can be helped to see the wisdom of broader and deeper methods of building peace. In that way, painful and dangerous compromises can be made in the context of communities that are steadily evolving new cultural ways to see each other. In other words, compromise is absolutely necessary, but it should be a mutually negotiated compromise so that neither side would feel it sacrifices uh, its most coveted, its most important um, um, elements of, uh, of identity. Encouraging cultural activities in, and creativity in conflict areas or areas affected by disasters will enable the affected communities to reconnect with their identities and regain a sense of normality, enjoying art and beginning to heal the scars of wars. Cultural programs may also help foster appreciation of cultural diversity and appreciation of the universal element in all cultures, helping to humanize the other and paving the way towards mutual understanding. It's relatively easy to, to say, relatively easy to put on paper, and so hard to achieve. So my part was uh, relatively easier to put down a few important thoughts. But what comes next? This is the, the challenge that we're faced with. So thank you for being so patient. And I hope that uh, we will have a really lively interaction. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, it, it was a speech indeed, because um, <clears throat> that was supposed to kick off the, the second day of the conference and, and, and the discussion. And I have a very, very great partner today. The senator will join uh, in uh, with his own remarks. But I think what's important is once we've uh, kind of uh, stated uh, the, the, the um, official uh, lines or the, the um, necessary lines, we have to talk. I think talking is to one another is essential. And it does not necessarily mean to happen in lofty political terms or, or philosophical terms. It has this, this dialogue, this talking to one another. It should always be down to earth. It should be grounded in our lives. We have to talk about our lives, how we live, and why some people do one thing, other people do a different thing. This is why, um, and then again, I mentioned this yesterday, uh, but I had no time to expound. I mentioned the, the, the danger of fundamentalism. But believe me, I don't mean religion only. Uh, fundamentalism can be a way of thinking of everybody of us. We may be, I may be fundamentalist about the way I see the running of this embassy. And I may not even be prepared to listen to to my staff, I'm trying to bring it really down to very simple um, uh, uh, thoughts. So the more we are prepared to, 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 to accept the reasoning of, of others, at least consider it, and then try to say our own, that, that's a, a, major, a major step forward. So to me, fundamentalism has always been, I'm afraid. I, I literally, physically fear fundamentalism because I, can, I have no plane, of no, no level of, of, of communication uh, uh, if I'm faced with that. The other thing which I believe is important, uh, and it's a great, another great Anglo-Saxon uh, kind of uh, wisdom, the excellent is the enemy of the good. We have to reach for the best and, and have to be ambitious in trying to achieve it. But we should also know that a good, a good progress, a good level of progress is as valuable as our final goal and that a final goal can never be achieved all at once. So uh, I'm trying to always remember uh, this uh, very, very practical, very useful uh, um, wisdom that we have to be realistic and, and plan accordingly. I wish I could give you a, a kind of a very uh, optimistic answer by saying everybody. Actually, um, I think we are all in the process of appreciating uh, um, the need for, for, for finding the sound ground, the sound territory of, uh, of dialogue. Um, actually, there are faith-based dialogues and, and interagency dialogues all over Europe because this is part of 
what Europe is all about. Europe has suffered tremendously in two world wars. And I think there is a lot of wisdom already about how, how unwelcome and how dangerous war is. And maybe this is why oftentimes Europe is referred to uh, as being uh, the lover of soft power, while let's say the United States is more in favor of hard power. And I think this is a debate which is still going on. Uh, but you see that at times of real crisis, Europe also has to, has to resort to, to um, uh, military uh, action. Um, the situation in Afghanistan, for example, and when ISAF went to Afghanistan, um, Europe, Europe, many European countries, practically Europe as, as European Union is part of, uh, of ISAF, was part of ISAF. Same goes for some conflicts in Africa as well. Uh, in other words, uh, there is no um, uh, a solution which will, at this point in time, exclude um, uh, regrettably, countermeasures to, to handle a war conflict or a hot conflict. But uh, believe me that um, the thinking, the philosophy of, uh, of, of a number of governments, of the governments of Europe, is not in direction of war. As I said, Europe has suffered a lot, and this is why we are more hesitant uh, in uh, uh, making decisions about uh, taking part in, in, in war actions. Uh, but you have, and now there is another thing though, uh, which should be also fairly and honestly recognized. Europe does not have an open conflict on its territory. Now what happened uh, with Crimea was the first in a long, long time. And again, it's not exactly uh, 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 the same type of conflict which you see in uh, in Africa or in, in, in the Middle East, um, although uh, its, its nature, its consequences uh, uh, are extremely serious, extremely grave. And this is why maybe Europe was used to believe that the peace has already uh, triumphed. And this is what we believed all these 25 years. This is why everybody, all governments were so um, uh, uh, alarmed by the actions of Mr. Putin in, um, in the Crimea. And this is why uh, sanctions were taken. Now, just again, by way of illustration, uh, sanctions. Um, of, of course, the, the civilized world believes that uh, uh, autocratic um, uh, aggressive actions uh, or war actions um, by, by, by uh, um, totalitarian uh, ruler need to be, uh, first of all, punished diplomatically by means of economic sanctions. And they have been applied to a number of countries. Um, Iran to, to, was a very vivid example. Now it's uh, Russia. It used to be former Yugoslavia. Um, to the extent to which these sac sanctions work, um, that is all, always a preferable tool. But now the big question is, and here we have again a little bit of a discussion with, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, should we proceed to level three of sanctions um, against Russia, which are not, again, they're not um, necessarily military sanctions, not at all, but the hardest, the harshest sanctions uh, of a, a whole set, a whole area of economic sanctions. And Europe, again, believes that uh, the hardest, the harshest measure should be taken only after we've been convinced that there is no possible other way out. While there is also another thinking that uh, in order to have a more effective action uh, of this or impact of the sanctions, the, the serious ones should be taken more quickly. Uh, I'm telling you all this uh, in a more descriptive way because there is not a single answer to, to, to your question. Like-minded, yes, when we discuss in a philosophical and an abstract way, we will all find ourselves on the same page. We all want a perfect world. We all want a peaceful world. And yet when it comes to measures, then um, different countries, because of different uh, histories, of different traditions, um, of different interests, if you wish, uh, may take different uh, action. So as I say, work in progress for a long, long time to come. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mark, how do you do that shortly? I don't know. Uh, listen, um, 
I will start by telling you something briefly about my country, which does not necessarily uh, give a short-term answer or solution. In Bulgaria, we have 10% Muslim population, and they're practicing Muslims. Um, and we've never, ever had any trouble with this population in the country. I think that the key to that is inclusiveness. They have their own party, and they participate in the political life uh, in the country on a regular basis. I should tell you that for the last 12 years, they've been the key factor of, uh, of Bulgaria's governments, a number of Bulgaria's governments, which were practically uh, coalition governments with their participation. So my, my uh, quick answer on the basis of uh, our experience uh, would be inclusion. Inclusion and uh, res granting responsibility. Mm, because if you, if you give responsibility, uh, not just rights, but also responsibility to, to certain uh, social groups or religious groups, uh, the, the hope would be that they will behave accordingly, that they would behave responsibly. Now, having said this, um, um, this is the result after several hundred years of cohabitation. So it may be like the, the English lawn, that it takes um, uh, uh, quite a few years before the uh, components of a, of a nation, especially if they have uh, stark differences, uh, arrive at the point of uh, true uh, uh, cohabitation and, and um, uh, understanding. In the case of Afghanistan, uh, I think that Afghanistan should uh, continue to rely on uh, um, respectful, guarded, and measured international engagement. Uh, because that could be a, 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 a positive, a stabilizing factor in the country. I think it will. Of course, it's for the individual groups and factions um, in Afghanistan to decide to what an extent they would like it to, uh, to happen. We have a similar situation with Iraq, actually, uh, that which still needs to be resolved. But my answer would be gradual inclusion, um, exclusion, and and internal confrontation will only deepen deepen the problems. And with Afghanistan, it has been going on for quite a few years. Not not it's not just the recent past that we remember, but we remember the 70s as well when. Um, just intervention didn't help at all. <laughs>